Hi, everybody. Um, I hope that you are all doing well. I will have exams back for you on Monday. That way, I, I will still be within a week. <laughs> um, and just so you know, uh, if you look at the schedule, it says there is a um, inquisitive assignment next week, and that inquisitive assignment is available and posted. It's all about MHC-related things. Um, it's next Wednesday that it's uh, due, but it's there if you want to start thinking about it. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about MHC structure and function. If you recall, uh, I told you about the human MHC system on Wednesday, which is known as the HLA locus. So HLA is a specific term for MHC in humans. Uh, we talked about the uh, genes um, being part of a very long region of the chromosome. Um, the genes in the class 1 region encode class 1 MHC. Um, the genes in the class 2 region encode class 2 MHC, um, et cetera. And in the case of um, humans, our class 1 molecules are HLA-A, HLA-B, and HLA-C, while our class II molecules are um, HLA-DP, HLA-DQ, and HLA-DR. We talked about the fact that these are the mo most polymorphic genes in the human genome, which means that there are lots of versions of HLA-A among the human population. Lots of versions of HLA-B, lots of versions of HLA-C, et cetera. And we name all of those versions with different numbers. So I might have HLA-A1 and A7. Uh, on my two versions of chromosome 6. And Carney might have HLA-A2 and A15. And we're all going to have different versions of them, and we indicate those different versions with numbers. Uh, the human MHC uh, was really first described by um, people who were looking at weird antigens on the surface of um, some cells in pregnant women. Um, so it was just like this uh, weird antigen that was on leukocytes, human leukocyte antigen. They didn't know anything about it or what it did. They just, that's what they called it. Um, the mouse MHC was described in experiments using uh, skin grafting. And you can see uh, some of the details of the experiments um, here. So we have a mouse of one strain. Um, it is the orange mouse. We have another mouse of another strain, which is the yellow mouse. Um, and in some of the experiments, we would cross these two mice and get an F1 progeny. Um, so you can see that in, at every chromosome, we've got one orange chromosome coming from the orange parent, who was inbred um, at the beginning, and one chromosome coming from the yellow parent, who was inbred. So we have this sort of half orange, half yellow progeny. And when um, people started doing some experiments here, they would think about donors, and they would think about recipients. And what they saw was that one parent, say the orange parent, could donate to other orange mice, um, but could not donate to mice of another strain, uh, the yellow mice. And that orange parent could also donate to the recipient, who, oh my gosh, also has orange. Um, 
Same thing, the yellow parent could donate to yellow parent, could not donate to orange parent who doesn't have uh, yellow. Um, we can also donate to the recipient. And you can see that the progeny who has both yellow and orange cannot donate to either parent because in either case, there's some kind of mismatch. Um, here, there's the mismatch is the yellow half. Here, the mismatch is the orange half. Um, but they can uh, donate to other progeny. And so they did more and more and more complicated um, crosses and skin grafting experiments to try to find out information about the genes that were governing transplant rejection. I will also tell you, sometimes students look at this and they take this to be the answer to all transplantation. And they're like, that's awesome. Next time I need a kidney, I just have to call my mom. Um, please note that these examples are showing the situation in inbred mice. Um, the fact that humans are not inbred complicates this genetics even further. Um, so do not imagine that this, that this means that all progeny can get all transplants from their, all their parents, because that's not the case <laughs> in non-inbred species. And the scientists who did these types of experiments came up with some genes that were particularly important for the success of these skin grafts. They found a really long region of the chromosome. And they made up a name for that region of the chromosome. Just like the people who were doing the human experiments said, this is the human leukocyte antigen part of the chromosome. Um, the folks who were doing the mouse experiments called this the H2 locus. And so H2 means mouse MHC um, and is sort of the equivalent of HLA in human. Um, the uh, genes don't line up quite as perfectly as you'd like them to, but we do still have a class one, class two, and class three regions that contain the same general types of genes. And so in mouse, The class one genes are H2K, H2D, and H2L, while the class two genes are H2IA and H2IE. One thing that you can notice here is when I told you about the human genes, I said the human class ones, I always remember A, B, and C because they have one letter. And I remember D, P, D, Q, D, R because they have two letters. In mouse, the class ones also have one letter, K, D, or L. And the class twos also have two letters, I, A, or I, E. Um, so that sort of holds up for us. Um, you can see that because things are annoying, officially, technically K is in this spot over here, away from D and L. I think whenever I draw it for you, I put K with D and L because I don't want to deal with that business. Um, and we've got the IA and IE molecules uh, here. The place where thinking about mouse MHC gets a little bit tricky is how we define different versions of K or D or L or IA or IE. So with human, I defined them with numbers. I said A1 versus A7. Well, these people who were doing these mouse crossing experiments use an old fashioned weird way of doing it, not numbers. <laughs> They instead talked about um, the haplotypes of their um, mouse strains. And so um, I'm going to sort of draw some of this out to um, help you understand. So 
some of these investigators um, took a mouse called a Belbsy mouse, which is the standard kind of white lab mouse. It's up in the um, top corner. And they looked at the genes in MHC on the chromosomes from that mouse. So there are my chromosomes. <laughs> there are, are the genes on the two chromosomes from this mouse. This is an inbred mouse. So its two versions of IA are going to be the same. Its two versions of IE are going to be the same, uh, et cetera. In fact, oftentimes when we're thinking about an inbred mouse, we just draw one chromosome because we know in our head there's two copies of that one chromosome. But I will say that sometimes people get confused on that. So there really are two. Um, and they said, OK, we, there is a version of K that this mouse has. And we are going to assign that version um, as K of D. So we're going to use this superscript small d to tell us which version of K it is. So it's called K of D. So both chromosomes have K of D. We're, all, we're actually going to call all of them the D version. So D of D, L of D, IE of D, and IA of D. Um, and so we use these little letter subscripts, um, or sorry, superscripts, to indicate um, which versions these mice have. Um, we also have a little bit of a shorthand for this, in that I know that a Balb C mouse is of the H2D haplotype. And what that means is that if, when I see this, I know that if I were to expand out and draw the whole chromosome, I'd put a little D next to every single one of the genes. It's the D version in every single one. So if you are of the H2D haplotype, that's a shorthand to tell you it should expand to looking like this. Black six mice, like the ones we used in lab, are of the H2B haplotype. So when I, when I see this information, that tells me that I have IA of B, I have IE of B, I have K of B, B of B, L of B all across. Um, and just sort of for clarity's sake, some students see this and they get it immediately. Some students don't totally get it even looking at this. So I'm going to show you the other thing that helps some people. Is we can imagine what would happen if I went to New York City this weekend. Might happen. Don't know. And I caught a mouse running around the subway. And so that mouse would be an outbred mouse. That would not be an inbred lab mouse. That would be an outbred mouse, kind of like humans are an outbred population. That mouse would still have two chromosomes. It would still have um, IA, IE, K, D, L on each chromosome. But it wouldn't have sort of a version that somebody de uh, defined necessarily in the lab. So it might have, on this chromosome, the same IA version as a black six mouse. So it might have IA of B. But it might have IA of S, some other version on its other chromosome. It might have IE of K. And then over here, it could have IE of B could have K of D, maybe K of A. I'm looking at some of the options up there. H. Uh, oh, there's a T. Um, there's Q. And this one can be B again. And so if, if I had an outbred organism, it would just have random versions. Here I would know, oh, this IA of B, it's the same version of IA that we had in the black six mouse. Um, 
I couldn't come up with some shorthand name like I did it, calling this whole B2, or the B6 locus B2B. Um, and so it, this is kind of the same thing we would see in humans, where is, instead of using numbers, I'm using these little superscript letters um, to indicate the versions of the alleles. Um, as you look at um, old exams and practice problems, you'll see a lot of this mouse nomenclature, and you'll see it we'll, as we go forward with some things about T cells. We'll be ta we'll be sort of having to think about the mouse uh, MHCs, so that's why it's important that we understand this nomenclature. Um, so for the rest of the time today, I want to talk a bit about aspects of MHC function. And specifically, I want to talk less about the genes today. We talked about the genes um, a second ago when we talked about the genes on Wednesday. Now we're really going to be talking about the, what, what does this protein look like? What is the structure of the MHC protein? And how do some parts of that structure relate to what we know about its function? The process of how we get the peptide broken down and put onto the MHC molecule is going to be the process that we talk about on Monday next week. So today we're really thinking about what is the structure of this MHC molecule actually look like um, and how is that related to some aspects of its function. Um, so I have to give you a uh, quick biochem refresher. Be ready. We are going to be spending a lot of time talking about proteins. <laughs> when thinking about proteins, there are a couple of things you should remember. Proteins are made up of amino acids. <laughs> um, remember with our amino acids, we have this amino or N-terminus. Um, it is usually positively charged. Um, we also have this carboxy terminus that is usually negatively charged. Um, the N terminus is the beginning of the protein. The C, the C terminus is the end. And basically what we, and we actually have an N and a C terminus on every amino acid. And when we join them together, we get this nice linkage. And so you can see here's NCC and then NCC, and you can have all these NCCs going on in a line uh, really repetitively. Um, I am going to ref to mention those as either the peptide backbone or the main chain atoms. Um, and so if I talk about the peptide backbone or the main chain, I just talk about this NCC, 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 NCC that goes on forever. <laughs> Each, and, and so you can see that at the bottom, all these NCCs. Each amino acid differs from each other because of what it has going on here with its chemistry, which is known as the R group. So our um, 20 amino acids each have 20 different R groups. Um, what you can notice is that the R groups are different sizes. They are different shapes. They're different charges. Um, and so I'm also going to make some references to the R groups. Um, and so this is just a reminder of what R groups are. Um, the two I often use as examples are lysine, which has this long skinny one with a charge at the end. <laughs> um, and the other one I like to use is either phenylalanine or tryptophan, or sorry, phenylalanine or tyrosine, which has this ring. Those are kind of my, off my frequent examples. Um, but you can see lots of different shapes, lots of different charges, lots of different sizes. All right, so in talking about the MHC proteins, we already have to start thinking a little bit about the divisions in MHC types that I already have told you about when thinking about the genetics, which I already told you about in the, on the chalkboard here. And that is because we have two different types of MHC proteins that are structured in two different ways. They are the MHC class one proteins and the MHC class two proteins. We already have seen that these are two different types because of we saw that their genes were in two different regions on the chromosome. The two proteins are structured in different ways. And so when we talk about MHC, we are going to specify if we're talking about MHC class 1 and its structure or MHC class 2 and its structure. And so we're first going to kind of talk about all the details of MHC class 1 
and then we'll talk about all the details of MHC class two. Um, I will tell you, say two things. One, um, MHC class one is, is my old favorite. So again, it, with examples, I'll probably usually default to class one because that's the one I think about the most often. Um, two, this lecture always freaks me out um, because the first time I was a TA as a grad student, I had to teach something about this, and I ended up drawing one of the most inappropriate drawings on the chalkboard. I was doing a drawing on the chalkboard like this and not looking, behind, looking at what I was doing, and I drew a super inappropriate drawing. And so I, the whole rest of the time today, I'm going to be like super on edge while I'm drawing about like make sure that I'm drawing something OK. Um, so let's hope no bad drawings today. <laughs> um, OK, so we're first going to look at um, MHC class one's structure. You can see some of the important features of the class one structure just from this image. So one thing to notice is that the MHC class one molecule only has one transmembrane domain, um, which is going to differ from class two that has those two transmembrane domains. You can also see that class one is largely made up of this one protein that has these three domains. They're all shown in yellow. So we've got this protein shown like this. Um, the, that one protein itself makes up the peptide binding pocket. And that MHC class one molecule is paired with this other protein. Um, you can see some example, another sort of set of examples of this here. So. Um, we've got our one protein that was shown in yellow on the other slide, also being shown in yellow here. And that is known as the MHC class one heavy chain, or sometimes the, also referred to as the alpha chain. It has three domains, alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three. Um, you can see the alpha three is a pretty standard immunoglobulin-like domain, um, alpha one and alpha two. Uh, are up here at the top. They're not shown as standard immunoglobulin domains. Alpha 1 and alpha 2 make up the peptide binding cleft. Alpha 3 has the transmembrane domain, um, and it is more of a structural support of that peptide binding cleft. Um, you can see the peptide, which is shown here as like a pink dot, um, is right in between that alpha 1, alpha 2 sort of we're looking along the line of the peptide. <laughs> um, and MHC class 1 pairs with a partner protein. That partner protein is shown here, um, and it is known as beta 2M or beta 2 microglobulin. Note that beta 2M is not covalently attached to the MHC class 1 heavy chain nor does it have a transmembrane domain. Um, so it is basically a free protein that comes in and stabilizes this entire structure. Um, it can actually come on and off. Um, and so, it's, so if you were, say, drawing MHC class 1, it would be important that beta 2M was present, that it was not connected to the heavy chain, and that it was not connected to have a transmembrane domain. Um, you don't get a fully folded class 1 until you have the class 1 heavy chain, beta 2M, and a peptide. Um, yes, Jay? So the heavy chain is alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. Um, so the heavy chain is all of this. And then this is beta 2M. Um, same thing, heavy chain is all of the yellow here. Beta 2M is the green. Um, now we're going to sort of pivot the MHC molecule, but first I think there's a question. Uh, yeah. So is the beta 2M just used to stabilize the structure? You can think of it as just stabilizing the structure. Um, the, the whole structure is not folded correctly and sort of in its final form until beta 2M is there. Um, one thing I forgot to mention about beta 2M um, is that beta 2M is a conserved protein. So we talked about the difference, all, all of the different versions of MHC class 1 that there are, how we all have different versions of MHC class 1. They all use identical beta 2Ms. 
So I have two different HLA-A's, two HLA-B's, two HLA-C's on my cell. They're all pairing with this same conserved beta-2M protein. Same kind or is that same one? Basically the same one. So like you have an identical beta-2M to me. Okay. Um, and, and so I mean, it's, my cell's making many copies of it. They're not all using, binding with the same copy, but it's the same, it's the same protein, just copies of it. Oh, yeah. Um, so right now we're sort of looking at the MHC molecule from the side, like we're standing in the membrane <laughs> looking at the MHC molecule. And so we can see the side of it, we can see the peptide from the side. Um, but we're going to kind of pivot on the next slide as if we were the T cell. And we're gonna be looking down at the MHC molecule. So we're gonna be up here looking down to look at the peptide binding cleft. Um, in general, the peptide binding clefts have these really nice um, beta sheets that make almost like a little tray. And then two alpha helices that make a little spot for the peptide. So we've got our little tray. We've got our alpha helices making a little spot for the peptide. But the MHC plus one peptide binding cleft has some uh, sort of unique features. So here we're looking now down at the peptide binding cleft. You can see our alpha helices. Those alpha helices are part of that same heavy chain protein. Um, and they make this little pocket, this cleft for the peptide. This image shows us one thing that is super important to know about the MHC class one binding cleft. Um, I don't know why I really like this figure. I know why I like this figure. But what I don't know is why they've stopped putting it in different editions of the textbook. And I have to use old editions. And I don't know why, because this is really important. <laughs> um, so in this figure, the white is that MHC class 1 heavy chain. And the red is the peptide. And what you should notice is that the binding, the, the cleft, the pocket, is closed on the end of the peptide binding cleft. You can see the peptide is completely surrounded here. What that means is that the MHC class 1 molecule is kind of picky about the peptides. If there was a peptide that was crazy long, it wouldn't fit in there. There's a limit to how big that peptide can be to fit in that MHC class 1 binding cleft. Um, it's because the tips of these alpha helices are so very close together. I feel like I should point that out because Cassano just walked by and point out the proteins. Um, so the tips of these come together really closely. The peptide can't like flap out <laughs> in the middle. We, are, we have this very constrained length. So with MHC class 1 peptides, um, MHC class 1 can only accept peptides that are between 8 and 10 amino acids in length. So this has to be a peptide between 8 and 10 amino acids in length. There is one other thing that is really important about that. So the closed ends, 8 to 10 amino acids in length. And there's one other thing that's really important about the MHC class 1 uh, peptide binding cleft, which is shown here. When we look at the peptide and we look at the rest of the binding cleft, we can look at the chemical interactions. Why doesn't Cassano walk by with this slide? Has some things he would really like. Um, we can actually look at which atoms of the MHC molecule are interacting with the peptide. And when we do that, we find that the MHC class 1 interacts with the R groups of the peptide. I'm going to now pivot us again. So we're going to be looking at the MHC molecule from the side instead of from the top. And so this is what we end up seeing with our MHC class 1 molecule and our peptide in the peptide binding pocket. So first of all, the peptide binding pocket has closed ends. So we can only fit a peptide of a specific length. Um, it's not shown here, 
but this part of the peptide binding cleft has a whole bunch of positive charges. This part has a whole bunch of negative charges. And as a result, the uh, amino terminus attracts really nicely to this end. And the carboxy terminus attracts really nicely to this end. So we've got the right charges to make the peptide want to hang out. Um, but the peptide binding pocket also is sort of shaped in different ways to accommodate the R groups of different amino acids. So here on the slide, you can see you know, we've got a triangly one here and a circly one here. I might think about it that really my peptide binding cleft has like a long skinny region here and then kind of a round one like this. And oh my gosh, it can fit a lysine <laughs> in that long skinny pocket. And it could fit a phenylalanine in this pocket and it wouldn't even have to be deformed. Um, <laughs> And so we can think about the location of the pocket. Is it around where the first amino acid would be, or the second, or the fourth? As well as sort of the shape and the charge and the size of that pocket that will be specific for certain types of amino acids. Um, these amino acids are known as the anchor residues. So they are anchoring that peptide into the MHC class one binding pocket. In fact, there was a very famous experiment. One reason why I like to tell you guys about this experiment is that this was actually done um, by two students as an undergraduate thesis. Um, back in the day, I don't remember what year it was. Um, but they isolated the MHC molecules off of the surface of some cells. So basically, they cut MHCs off the surface of cells. And then they sequenced the peptides in those MHC molecules. And they found that if they looked at you know, MHC number one, they could get all sorts of different peptides. But those peptides always had certain amino acids in common. Like they always had a G at position two, and a P at position three, and an either I or an L at position nine. And if they looked at a different, and so what they realized is in order to bind to the pocket, of MHC variant number one, there, po there must be a pocket that needs a G and a P at sort of position two, and an L or an I at position nine. So that must be what the shape of the pocket is. These are the anchor residues that you need to have to anchor into that MHC, to bind in. The rest of them can vary. The rest of the peptides can vary. So all sorts of peptides from all sorts of microbes can be presented as long as they have these common features. And if they looked at the peptides that came from a different MHC molecule, they could see that now they often had a tyrosine at position, y, or position two and an isoleucine or a valine at position nine. Um, so each MHC type has, each MHC class one type had some specific unique anchor residues um, that were sort of characteristic for that um, protein. Um, you can also see that here, um, that any different MHC molecule will have some kind of you know, peptide binding motif, like this one always binds something with an R at position two and an R or a K at position nine. Um, and as a result, you can get a whole bunch of peptides from a whole bunch of different sources that can bind to that MHC as long as they have that one common motif, as long as they have those anchor residues um, to help anchor the peptide into the MHC molecule. Um, so as we will see more uh, on Monday, our different types of MHC molecules also get their peptides from different places. So that's another big difference between class one and class two is where does the peptide come from? In the case of MHC class one, the peptides come from the cytoplasm of the cell. So here we've got a cell making MHC class one. It's got some peptide. And that peptide came from the cytoplasm of the cell. 
Now let's imagine for a second that we're thinking about dealing with some microbes. Can you imagine a type of microbe that might have its proteins in the cytoplasm of a cell? It's probably the, the most straightforward way the proteins are going to be in the cytoplasm of the cell as opposed to anywhere else. Yeah, my, oh, Delaney? From a virus. Viruses are taking over the cell or using the cell's machinery, including the ribosomes. So the virus's proteins are all going to be in the cytoplasm of cells. And in fact, typically, we think about MHC class 1 presenting viral proteins, um, though officially they are presenting any cytoplasmic protein. And you'll see that coming forward as well. Um, so we talk, when we talked about the innate immune response, um, we talked about a little bit about how some of the PRRs were cool because they responded to a particular type of microbe. And they also gave you a kind of response that was good for that kind of microbe. And we sort of see the same thing with MHC class 1. Um, the MHC class 1 is largely presenting viral peptides. And the responses, the immune responses that happen as a result of MHC class 1 uh, are going to be particularly good at uh, virus dealing with viruses. Um, before, and I want you to remember that thought, because it comes up in a couple of slides, but I have to tell you something else first. So the one, so right here, we're, you know, we're really thinking about that MHC molecule plus peptide binding to the T cell receptor. Remember, this whole discussion of MHC is really so that we can think about T cells and how T cells work. So right now, we're really trying to think about having a thing that can bind to the T cell receptor. Unfortunately, the T cell receptor has a little bit of a problem in that it's binding to um, whatever it wants to bind to. Uh, and in this case, MHC plus peptide is quite weak. So this uh, binding is really, really weak. Um, you can see that here um, compared to some other types of biochemical interactions. So the T cell does not bind things very strongly. In order for a T cell to interact with MHC plus peptide, we need to have some other proteins involved. And those other proteins are really important for giving us more binding strength. So you know, we don't hold with one hand, we hold with two hands. So we get better strength. In the case of MHC class 1, that other partner protein is called CD8. So here you can see an MHC class 1 molecule with its peptide binding to a T cell receptor. It's a little bit of a weak interaction. But fortunately, that T cell also has this protein, CD8, that can interact with the MHC molecule. So CD8 is interacting with this alpha-3 domain of the MHC heavy chain. And this is stabilizing the um, MHC TCR interaction. So you can see that here. And when we're thinking about MHC class 1, it's always interacting with CD8. So now, remind me which um, pathogen we are likely thinking about with MHC class 1? Viruses. Viruses, right? What, what do you think might be a good thing to do with a cell that is infected with a virus? If you have a cell that's infected with a virus, what, what do you think is probably the best defense there? Kill it? What are we going to do? Eliminate it. Kill it. MHC class 1 is going to be presenting peptides that were from the cytoplasm, which are usually viral. And specifically, the T cells that MHC class 1 turns on are CD8 positive T cells. 
because they needed to have CD8 for this interaction. CD8 positive T cells are the ones that do killing, are the killer type. So all of these pieces come together. We're going to present cytoplasmic peptides. That's going to turn on a CD8 positive T cell. The CD8 positive T cell is going to kill that cell that had stuff in its cytoplasm. Um, so we also have one other thing we should think about. Again, if you were in charge of designing the immune system, you had to think about this. Which cells of the body should be able to put things on MHC class 1 and show it off at the surface? Which cells of your body maybe could get infected with a virus and should be able to show off peptides from their cytoplasm on their surface? We thought about something similar when we thought about who should be able to respond to interferon. Yeah, Brianna. All of them. All of them. Um, so when we actually look to see which cells have MHC class 1 on their surface, the answer is really all but one kind. There's only one cell of your body that doesn't have MHC class 1 on its surface. Um, so MHC class 1 is shown here in this left column. Um, it's kind of trying to tell me, us if there's like a lot or a little. Just think about they all as yes, except for this one that is no. What's the one cell that ha is a no, that doesn't have MHC class 1 on its surface? Yeah, Michael. Uh, red, blood red blood cells. You remember anything interesting about red blood cells from lab one? There's Lainey. They don't have a nucleus, right? Because they don't have a nucleus, Viruses don't really care about them. They can't be useful for viruses. So we often say, when we ask the question, which cells express MHC class 1, that the answer is all nucleated cells. <laughs> and there's only one kind of cell that doesn't have a nucleus. It's the red blood cell. Um, and a virus isn't going to use a red blood cell because it doesn't have a nucleus. So basically, all of your cells have MHC class 1 on them. So right now, every single cell of your body has your two different types of HLA-A, your two different types of HLA-B, your two different types of HLA-C on the surface. Right now, all the time, 24-7. Um, we can contrast all of this with MHC class 2. Um, and so now we're going to move into thinking about MHC class 2. Um, MHC class 2 structurally looks a bit different than MHC class 1. So the first thing that you should notice is that MHC class 2 molecules are actually made up of two proteins um, that are sort of similar in size. If you look back at a bunch of the genetics that I showed you in the past, um, so actually probably the best example is this one. You can see IA here, and you can see it actually shows two IAs. And here's IE, and there's two IEs. If you look, at, if you look very closely at any of the different versions of the uh, genetics that you saw, there were often two genes for class two that I was kind of glossing over. The reason why there are two is because we actually have two proteins that are coming together, um, an alpha chain and a beta chain. They both have transmembrane domains. They both have um, the immunoglobulin-like domains. and it's only the pairing of them together that makes the peptide binding cleft. So you can see there are two separate proteins coming together, um, and it's the alpha-1 domain and the beta-1 domain making that peptide binding cleft. Um, we do have the two transmembrane domains here. Um, with MHC class 1, we had that beta-2M protein, which was non-covalently interacting with the heavy chain. It also didn't have a transmembrane domain. Um, and one thing that uh, I used to take advantage of in experiments in grad school is that MHC class 1 actually has a rate that we, use, we sometimes talk about as its breathing rate, where, M, where beta 2M goes on and off. <laughs> um, and there's some ways you can play with that, and it's really cool. MHC class 2 
is a crazy stable protein by comparison. It isn't going to be folded correctly until you get uh, the alpha chain, the beta chain, and the peptide. But when you have that, it is incredibly stable. This is going to become a pro an issue that we have to think about a little bit more on Monday. It is so stable that, it, um, again, those of you who think about some biochem will be surprised by this. It is known as SDS stable. So SDS is this chemical we use to, to unfold proteins. If you put SDS on this whole quaternary structure complex, it doesn't come apart. This is that stable. <laughs> this is a crazy, crazy, crazy stable molecule um, when you have all three of these pieces together. So just like we did with class one, we're going to pivot now and look down on the class one molecule. And this is what we're going to see for our peptide binding cleft. So first of all, you will notice that the two sides of the peptide binding cleft are drawn in different colors in all of the different images. That's because they're coming from different proteins. Part of it is coming from the alpha protein, part of it's coming from the beta protein. You get an alpha helix from each of them making up this peptide binding cleft. The other thing that's super important is in this image from this textbook that I don't know why they discontinued this image because it's really good, <laughs> is you can look at the ends of the peptide binding cleft. So again, you can see it's white and it's blue because it's coming from two different proteins. But you can also see that the end of the peptide isn't really covered. <laughs> you don't see a constraint on the end of the peptide. This peptide could actually be a little bit longer and it would still fit here. Um, oftentimes, immunologists like to talk about how the class one or the class two binding cleft looks like a hot dog bun with a hot dog that's sort of sticking out the ends. Some textbooks even now at this point show a picture of a hot dog in a hot dog bun, but I was pretty sure you knew what that looked like and I didn't need to put it on the slide. Um, so with class two binding cleft, one thing that we think about is that there isn't that sort of constraint. For class one, it was eight to 10 amino acids in length was all that would fit. For class two, we often talk about 10 to 20, but it really can be kind of any length um, because the ends are open, the edges of the peptide can flop out. The other big difference about the class two binding cleft um, is shown here. So again, we can take a look at um, the biochemical interactions between the binding cleft and the peptide. And when we look at that, we see that the uh, peptide binding cleft is mostly making interactions with the main chain atoms or the backbone, that NCC, NCC, NCC of the peptide. We're not seeing the peptide binding cleft make a lot of interactions with the R groups. Um, so one thing that you should realize here is that with MHC class two, that means we don't really see anchor residues in the same way that we do for class one. Because the R group isn't really making contacts with the MHC molecule, the MHC molecule doesn't care which R groups are there. Every amino acid has the same backbone. Um, sometimes you can see like sort of patterns, and sometimes people talk about class two anchor residues. I always think they're baloney when I hear about them. Because like, okay, so here, yeah, they all these peptides have an L or an F or an I, which is not really that conserved. And in this one, it's the fifth. And this one, it's the fourth. And this one, it's the seventh. And because the peptides can be different lengths, so it doesn't matter exactly where the ends are and how much they flop out the side. And it's really not that strict in what amino acid it is, because we're not making a ton of contacts with the, the main chain. So class two is not as strict about which peptides it binds compared to class one. Um, it, we really don't see kind of a specific motif, a specific sequence, um, or anchor residues for class two. Um, so with class two, 
we will often see, we, or we see our peptides coming from a different location in the cell. For class two, our peptides are coming from the endocytic pathway in the cell. So specifically, we are getting those types of peptides either from a phagosome, so a compartment inside the cell that was made as a result of phagocytosis or some other kind of compartment in the cell like um, is being like an endosome or something like that. Um, in uh, Bio 250, you learned about sort of the biosynthet biosynthetic secretory pathway, um, also known as the endocytic pathway or the secretory pathway. You know, the Golgi, the endosome, the ER, all that business. Class 2 is getting its peptides from that pathway, not from the cytoplasm. As you will see so much more on Monday, um, immunologists, in fact, often think about the cell as having two big compartments. The cytoplasm, which is shown in yellow here, and the endocytic pathway, or the compartments, which are shown here in white. And notice that the white is the same color as outside of the cell. Both this endocytic compartment and outside of the cell are across the membrane from, a, from the cytoplasm. So if something wants to get here, it has to solve the problem of crossing a membrane. Something wants to get here, it has to solve the problem of crossing a membrane. So with uh, immunology, the sort of are you on the same side of the membrane as the cytoplasm, or are you on a different side of the membrane from the cytoplasm? Ends up being a big deal. That's going to be a big deal on Monday. Um, so class two is presenting from basically from places that are across a membrane from a cytoplasm. Either something that was outside of the cell that got phagocytosed, or something that was already in one of those compartments. And so it, for most cases, this is either going to be something living in a compartment in the cell, like one of those bacteria that I showed you about that could live in a phagocyte. Or this is something that has been phagocytosed by maybe a macrophage. So it's something the macrophage ate from outside. That MHC class two molecule also has low affinity for uh, the TCR. Um, and again, we need that partner, we need a partner protein, sort of a second hand to hold to give us good interaction. And in this case, the partner protein is called CD4. Again, you can see that CD4 is binding to um, the back of the MHC class 2 molecule, this beta 2 subunit. Um, one thing I didn't mention with class 1 and CD8 is also true here. Um, this back part of the MHC that in this case is being bound by CD4 and the other case was being bound by CD8 is, is not variable between different MHC molecules. So you don't have to worry about like some MHCs bind CD4 well and some don't. That's like a super conserved uh, region. So uh, CD4 is binding to class 2, CD8 is binding to class 1. Um, Someone on uh, one of the podcasts I was on mentioned to me that the reason why they remember it, that is that if you do the multiplication, you always get eight. So four times two is eight, and eight times one is eight. Um, so that's how they can remember which ones go together. Um, and um, as a result, MHC plus peptide is the antigen for a CD4 positive cell. Um, so we're going to be now seeing our CD4 positive T cells specifically attacking things that are presenting peptide on MHC class 2. And with MHC class 2, we're generally looking at either something that we have endocytosed or phagocytosed or something that is living in a compartment in the cell. In those cases, your best bet might not be to kill this whole cell. It might be to do something, like if you kill this cell, 
Well, that doesn't actually do anything against this little flowery guy that was hanging out outside. Whatever made it is still there making it. So maybe you need to turn on some other aspects of immune responses instead of just killing the cell. And so the CD4 cell is going to be a helper, is going to influence other types of immune responses instead of killing the cell that it sees. So again, all these pieces are coming together. Um, we also can think about which cells are expressing our MHC uh, molecules. So if you recall, with MHC class 1, we saw that all nucleated cells were presenting on MHC class 1. This is different for MHC class 2. When I think about MHC class 2, I only think about three types of cells. So really, only three types of cells in your body are presenting on MHC class 2. This is the figure from your textbook. It is correct that there are some situations where T cells present. We're never going to think about that ever again. Like, yeah, I know why they put that there, because that's correct. But really, it's these three. <laughs> I wish I almost put a white box over that, but I decided not to be lying. Um, so there are only three kinds of cells in your body that present class 2. Um, they are B cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. So they are all types of um, immune cells. Um, Note, in fact, this is one of those differences between macrophages and neutrophils. So neutrophils don't present on class 2. Remember, I sort of think about macrophages as like fancy bonus neutrophils because <laughs> they do PRR stuff. It's also because they can present on class 2. So there are only three types of cells that um, present on class 2, and they are known as the professional antigen presenting cells or professional APCs. Um, Two of them are cells of the innate immune system, the dendritic cell and the macrophage, which are both closely related to one another. Um, and they are very important for helping to turn on that adaptive response. Um, the fact that B cells are professional antigen presenting cells is both important for um, thinking about how T cells work, but is also a key piece of B cell biology. So again, it's one of the reasons I had to tell you all this stuff before I told you what happened to our B cell. <laughs> There are a few other types of cells that can sometimes present on class 2. I care that you are aware of one of them. So yes, this shows a bunch of them. There's only one I actually care about. And the one that I care about are thymic epithelial cells. So really, when I think about presentation on class 2, I think about four cell types. I think about B cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells, the professional APCs. And I think about thymic epithelial cells. Thymic epithelial cells are cells of the thymus. And we've already seen the thymus. It is one of our primary lymphoid organs. Um, and it is where, as you will see uh, in a week or something, where T cells develop. And so actually, it's important that we have some class 2 around when T cells are developing. So yes, we do have some class 2 expression in the thymus um, to help support T cell development. Um, but it's not uh, for making an immune response. The one the, For making an immune response, it's dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells. Uh, so we can see our compare and contrast of class 1 and class 2 here. Um, the peptide binding domain in class 1 is made of two parts of the same protein, alpha 1 and alpha 2. Um, in class 2, it's made of parts of two different proteins, for the alpha and beta, alpha 1 and beta 1. Um, the nature of the peptide binding groove is closed at both ends for class 1, open at both ends for class 2. Um, you can see the size of the bound peptide varies pretty dramatically. For class 1, it is 8 to 10. <laughs> for class 2, I always learn 10 to 20. This says 13 to 18. Whatever. <laughs> um, with the uh, class one, we have anchor residues. Um, we have um, some charges in the pocket. Um, and this says some conserved residues, but not really ideal. Um, and here you can also see the compare and contrast of the structure. Um, you can see our class 1 with this heavy chain and the conserved beta 2M, as well as the peptide. 
Um, and with uh, class two, you can see the, the um, polymorphic alpha and beta chains with the peptide. Um, class one is on all nucleated cells. Class two is only on um, the dendritic cells, macrophages, B cells, and uh, the thymus. Um, class one gets its peptide from uh, the cytosol. Class two gets its peptides from endosome or lysosome. Class one turns on CD8 T cells. Class two turns on CD4 T cells. Um, so, any questions about any of that? Okay. Um, so, I didn't have time to talk through this on um, Wednesday, so I wanted to just make sure we talked through this as well. Um, this is a uh, question that I've asked students in the past, um, question that I can ask myself in the past is where is the eraser? Um, and so here I'm asking um, to identify the MHC haplotypes. Um, and you can also notice that this is listed as being four points because guess what? There are four parts to the answer. Um, so remember that a haplotype is defined as a group of genes that are inherited together. So what I want to know is which genes are inherited together. It's sort of a fancy way of saying which ones are on the same chromosome. Um, and we have a father, a mother, and a child here. So the way that I would actually work this out is I would think about um, the child, and I would know that the child got half of its MHGs from its mom from one of mom's chromosomes. We'll call that mom chromosome one. And that child got the other half of its MHCs from dad, one of dad's chromosomes. We'll call that dad's chromosome one. If we look at the child, we can say, well, which HLA-A molecule did this child get from their mother? Yeah, Michael. A2. That's one that they have in common. They couldn't have gotten A20 from their mother because their mother didn't have it to give to them. So the child must have had, so mom must have had A2 on one of her chromosomes. Which B did the child get from the mother? 27. So B27 must have been on the same chromosome because that's the one that mom gave. What DR was on that chromosome? 3. It has to be 3 because she has two threes. <laughs> OK, so that's one of the four haplotypes in this family. That's, there's one chromosome being transmitted in this family that has this combo of A, B, and DR. What was the chromosome that the child got from the dad? A20. A20. OK, what about the B? B57. OK. DR5. OK, so here's a second chromosome. But I told you there was four parts to the answer. And we got two. Well, we, we just listed what was on one of mom's chromosomes and what's on one of dad's chromosomes. We can figure out what's on mom's other chromosome. So one of mom's chromosomes has A2, B27, and DR3. What does mom's other chromosome have on it? Yep, Carney. The ones, the, the ones that didn't give to the child. A3, B12, DR3. Mom was unlucky that she has DR, two, the same DR on both of her chromosomes. All right, what about dad? What was dad's other chromosome? Again, it's the one that didn't give to the child. Michael. Uh, A1, uh, B7, and B2. OK, so these would be the four haplotypes of the family. Basically, these are the four chromosomes that are present in this family that could be passed around. 
Um, so that is how you would address a question like this, um, which, like I said, I ran out of time for on Wednesday, but here it is today. Um, I will see you guys on Monday.